Hey, welcome back everybody. Jeff Frick here with theCUBE. We're at the Western Digital Offices in Milpitas, California at a really interesting event. It's put on by the Auto Tech Council Innovation in Motion, and it's all about mapping and navigation. So you might think the mapping wars are over, but we're just hearing uh, in the keynote presentation, it's a multi-billion dollar industry, uh, a big part of which is, is driven by autonomous vehicles and all the things that are happening there, but it goes well beyond that. So we're excited to, hear, to be here and, and talk to some of the principals about what's going on in this, in this space. So our next guest is Mirko Kirschbaum. He's the CEO and founder of Pegasa. So first off, Mirko, welcome. Thank you. So what is Pegasa for people that aren't familiar? So Pegasa is a consulting company, and I started this company about two and a half years ago because I realized that a lot of companies want to come into Silicon Valley, but they don't know what to do here. They don't know who to meet with, who to partner with, and they don't have experience in this whole ecosystem. And I'm helping them because I've been here for almost 10 years and I know the industry really well. So do you focus on a particular type of company that wants to get here, a particular type of a vertical? Who are, who are your it's clients? It's mainly the transportation automotive vertical. Okay. That's my background. Okay. And that's where I have expertise. And we've seen all the car uh, companies are here. They've got offices all over the place on Now 101 in Palo Alto. Yep. What other types of autom uh, automobile industry players are trying to either set up a presence or at least a connection with Silicon Valley? So initially it was just the car makers. Then you saw the big tier ones, the automotive suppliers moving in. So companies like Bosch and, and Continental. And now you're even seeing tier two companies, tier three companies coming in companies that want to get into the automotive space. So it's it's an entire ecosystem that's moving in with the car makers. Right, it's, it's, it's kind of interesting to note because there was a similar wave uh, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, into LA for design, mm -hmm. and we saw a lot of the car companies set up their design centers down in, in Los Angeles. So when they're coming here, are they looking for specific technology? Are they looking for engineering? Are they looking for just kind of the, the innovation juju that we have going on here? Well, you know, what are their objectives when they come here? I think it's a combination of all the things that you just mentioned. So one is just everybody is here. If you want to have meetings with five, six companies, you can do it in one day. We're all within half an hour, 40 minutes distance. You have car makers, you have chip makers, you have telecom companies, you have IT experts. It's all in one spot. And it's, I don't think that exists anywhere else, maybe in Tel Aviv to a certain degree. And then it's also just the, the education that's here, the mindset of people. You have very smart people that have worked in different jobs. It's just a perfect setup in every way. Right, and the, and the thing you just touched on too, which I don't think a lot of people think through all the components that are involved in a self-driving car. Yeah. Um, there, you know, you think of sensors and maybe a little bit of mapping and, and, and does, it, does it stop or not when it's supposed to, but there's a ton of different technologies. I, I saw some video a professor was giving a kickoff on his autonomous vehicle. Uh, uh, class and he had this laundry list of all the different types of technologies and things you got to think about that all come together as this thing is rolling down the road. Yeah, well, what you're seeing is, I mean, the, in the old days, the car was a separate system. It was pretty much owned by the car makers, a few T1s, few tier twos, and that was it. But now with connectivity and data and cybersecurity, I mean, there's connections to almost any other vertical. And that's what makes it so exciting. You have machine vision companies coming in. We're looking into biometric technologies, monitoring what you're doing, what your health is. We have uh, camera sensor companies that, that you never even had heard of. We're now looking into um, sensing smell because you don't have people in the car anymore. You need ears outside of the car because people will not be in the car. So those are all new technologies that are making their way into the car and that's just really exciting and new. Pretty good times for you. So, so yes. mapping and navigation, what brings you to this event today? So mapping and navigation is going to be very critical for autonomous driving. And, and, and a key enabler is obviously either having machine vision systems that help you capture the, the accurate information all the time because the car will need to know, is your construction, are there potholes, are there any, any obstacles? So it might be crowdsourced. And then the other um, thing that's, that's really important is there's going to be a lot of data being generated. How is it going to be managed? How it's going to be analyzed? How are you going to store it in the car, in the cloud? Who's going to store it? Who's going to own it? So it's going to be a big, big market battle around this data 
and and who will have an edge on it, right? So right, it's right. really interesting. Yeah, the whole data, not only is there a lot of data that needs to be processed, but you bring up a whole nother uh, kettle of fish, which is who owns the data, who has access to the data, who can build value-added algorithms based on that data. I think there's an interesting thing I saw once on some of the Google cars, um, is that there's not only the data of what that Google car does, but the environment data as it passes through the environment for things like where do bicycle riders ride on the edge of the street mm -hmm. and and all these factors that this collecting data far more than just its performance as a self-driving car Absolutely, yeah. so who does own that data yeah. I mean it's it's traffic signs uh, when's the street cleaning coming because then you can park is there an open parking spot that you could put on an app and then guide people into it it's potholes, it's construction, it's, it's other things that are critical if you have autonomous cars, and just in general, even today now. I mean, cities want to know, where are the open parking spots? Is there any damage to the road? Are there any other things in the way? So it's huge having right. access to the data. Yeah, it's interesting because you can really crowdsource it with this exactly. mobile yeah. this mobile sensing machine that can pull in all types of data to yeah. feedback. I hadn't even thought about how they get the data for the self-parking apps. You'd get it from other cars that happen to exactly. be driving down the exactly. street. That's great. All right, super. So you've been in the business for a while. As you see kind of this crazy um, acceleration of compute and storage and networking, yeah. um, how long do you think this is going to take before we see a lot more of these vehicles on the road? I mean, you see them today. Right. right? By living in Palo Alto. So we yeah, see the, yeah. so for we see us the Waymo almost, cars yeah, we're, all the time. We're right? used to them all, right. already. I mean, there's Fords and there's Waymo cars and then other companies are trying them. I mean, there's a long list of approved companies now and interesting names. But I think to, and you'll see it in faces, it's going to be very limited and also the, it's going to be very weather dependent. Right, here's perfect conditions, right, it's, right. it's nice and dry and warm. Um, for Montana and other places where it's a little bit tougher on the weather, it's gonna take longer time right. because there's some problems there. So I think it's gonna come in waves. So here will be a, a launch now, but to see it fully deployed, not just in the US, I'm also thinking about other countries like Brazil and India with, with totally different problems to solve, it's going to be a much more longer time. So right. there we're talking decades. But then again, you also have to think about, um, can you set aside certain areas or lanes for those cars? Because you'll have an interim phase. Right. In the interim phase, you will have non-autonomous vehicles, semi-autonomous vehicle, and fully autonomous vehicles. So how are all those cars working with each other, with drivers, with a driver's license, maybe drivers without a driver's license? because they can only ride in an autonomous vehicle. Right, so right. how is it all going to work together? It's right. going to be a very interesting time. Right. Once they're all autonomous, I think it's going to be easy. Because right. then it's just going to be like in an airplane. You have an air traffic controller, somebody's managing all those cars, they talk to each other, there's vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communication. But having them all together, that's going to be an interesting time. And again, that's before we, again, all these second order impacts of, you know, parking structures that are no longer needed in the city because yeah. you have these things park off site or car insurance yeah. when these things don't crash so much uh, yeah. as we do when we're distracted by whatever. So yeah. pretty exciting times. All right. Well, Mirko, I'll let you get back to the conference. A lot Thank of stuff you. going on next door. And thanks for uh, taking a few minutes to stop by. You're welcome. All Thank right. You. He's Mirko. I'm Jeff. You're watching theCUBE from the Automotion, uh, Auto Tech Council Innovation in Motion event. Thanks for watching.